Morning Church family. How are we doing? Good. Well, my name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here at the Church of Lake Mead, and I have the privilege of getting to lead a few areas of ministry here at the church. Um, like Brad mentioned, our area of Next Gen Ministries and Young Adults. I'm excited for in a couple of weeks, we're starting Club 46. That's our fourth through sixth graders. Very excited for that. And I also helped lead Alpha. If you never heard of Alpha, I absolutely love Alpha. Um, and it's coming, it's starting in September. You'll get to hear more about that. But I love Alpha because in my journey of faith with Jesus, I've had lots of questions, I've had a lot of doubts. And Alpha serves as a place, a safe place for people to wrestle through these questions. Because the reality is our God wants us to wrestle through these questions, not let them go off the side. He wants to use those questions in our journey of seeking him out for who he truly is. And so in Alpha, it's a good space for those who are, who are wrestling through questions about Christianity and those who are seeking out uh, God. Maybe they have, you have yet to put both feet in for following Jesus, and it's because you have some questions. Alpha is a great spot for you. So I'm excited for that. That's coming up in September. But today we are continuing our sermon series, Sunday School. And over the last few weeks, over the summer, we've been talking about uh, the examples of faith in the Old Testament. We've talked about Moses, we've talked about Jonah, we've talked about King David and Abraham. And, you know, I thought it would be a shame if we went through the entire series without mentioning one of the most important figures of the Old Testament. Uh, no doubt you've heard of his name. Uh, there's a lot written about him. Uh, he, uh, he was known in Hebrews 11, records him as a man who was pleasing to God. In fact, God was so pleased with him that God spared him from experiencing death itself. His story, honestly, okay, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I led you a little bit too far. There's not a lot written about him in the Old Testament. It's only four verses in Genesis. Uh, and of course, the person I'm talking about is Enoch. Uh, so not a lot written about Enoch. I know some of you guys thought I was going with Elijah. There's only two people. That would be a possibility. There's two people in the Old Testament who were saved from having to experience death, got picked up out of, out of, uh, out of earth into heaven in God's presence. And I thought it'd be funny in a way to pick Enoch because, yeah, in Sunday school, you don't hear about Enoch. That's not a story. Normally you hear about, uh, about Jonah or, or uh, Noah with the flood, right? And uh, we don't hear about Enoch. But yet, Enoch is mentioned in Hebrews 11, like I said, in the hall of faith. He's one of the first people that's mentioned. And he is uniquely highlighted as someone uh, who pleased God. Here's what the text says in Hebrews 11, 5. That's what it has to say. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. I cannot think of something more important to know about yourself than that you were found pleasing to God. In the human experience, our souls so desperately have a need to feel like we are known, that we're seen for who we are, and that we're accepted as we are. That he's, and that God, to know that God is pleased with us gives us rest and peace, the rest and peace that we're so desperately seeking in our souls. And so for me in hearing this, uh, I read this and I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've wondered, and I wonder if you wondered the same question, is God pleased with me? Is God pleased with me? I find myself in moments in life where I start to feel like, okay, I've done this in my life. There's no way. Does God look at me when he looks at me? Does he look at me with favor or does he look with me with displeasure? Is he, uh, have I done enough to, to, for God to be satisfied with me? Am I doing the right things for him to give me the thumbs up and approval? Is God distant and waiting for me to accomplish or do a certain amount of things before he gives me that approval? What is he like? What, is, what does he think of me? And, you know, I have these moments, uh, and it's in reading a text like this where I get some encouragement. Man, there's someone who's found to be pleasing to God. So I read that, and I'm like, okay, how? How and why? Why is it that this man, Enoch, is, is found as one who is pleasing to God? Well, we're going to open our Bibles to the book of Enoch. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I, 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 
I had to say that, but it's not even in the Apocrypha, okay? But, it's, but he is mentioned in, uh, in Genesis uh, 5, and there's only four verses, like I said, about him. And, uh, and for a good reason, there's only four verses said about him because there's something very important about him. We find out why he's found pleasing to God. But before we get there to Genesis 5, I want to catch us up, to, up through Genesis 4. So, so far in chapter 1, God, the God of the universe created all things. He created uh, the earth, he created the waters, he created the land, he created the animals, the plants, vegetation. And then there was a peak moment in God's creation story where he creates humanity. The text specifically highlights human beings. And this is what the text says. It says that he created man and woman in his image. And he gave them the authority to rule over creation and to rule it and to steward it in such a way that it would flourish and bring glory to God. And this is the, the work of human beings. And in our core to our identity of, of who we are as humans is to be God's representative in this world. And praise be to God. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead here, but praise be to God. He brings Jesus who reconciles us to himself and restores that identity to be faithful ambassadors to a good and loving God. But it's, so in, in Genesis, the story, there's this peak moment, he creates human beings. And then these human beings decide, they have a moment in chapter three, it's called the fall. The snake who is represented as the Satan, our adversary comes and begins to tempt them to, and gets them to start questioning God's goodness and says, God's holding, basically holding back from you. In fact, he knows that if you would just take this fruit that he told you not to eat, that you would become like him. And so the humans listen to the snake and they take the fruit, they disobey God, they disregard God as God and start to define good and evil on their own terms. And what we see take place is death, death in their spirit, their relationship with God, and they ex experience that they're exposed. And, and then God in looking for them comes to them and and does pronounce a curse over them in the snake and over the land. And as the author, uh, as uh, Paul says in Romans, this is actually a blessing. What he's preventing or preserving for us in allowing us to experience the suffering that sin brings is one, to reveal to us the nature of our sin, how damaging and how bad it really is, but then two, also to preserve us from entering into that for eternity. And so this, this is actually a blessing a blessing in disguise, but then it's actually made really clear what God's doing in the midst of it because he provides a prophecy. He says, in, in all this suffering that's going to take place, I promise to deliver you. He says, I will provide uh, a man in the, uh, from Adam's offspring. He's going to follow uh, the, from his seed, from his offspring, will come a man who will eventually stomp the head of this serpent that brought this destruction in to God's creation. And so it's in that story we find Enoch. If we get, there's this genealogy reporting from Adam down Seth's lineage, and then Enoch is found as the seventh person from Adam. And what's interesting about Enoch is that the people leading up to Enoch, all that you hear about them is the amount of years that they lived and then who they fathered. But Enoch reserves a little bit of attention. And this is what the scriptures say about Enoch. In Genesis 5, 21, when Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. And he had, another, he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. So super unique. Enoch is lifted in the text. He's, he's highlighted here. One is one, a person who is literally saved from experiencing death. God takes him. That's something worth noting. But what the author is doing here, what Moses is doing in highlighting this phrase twice, this living faithfully with God, this walking with God faithfully, commentators say this is a way for him to, to highlight that, that Enoch really walked with God. Like, there are people who have a relationship with God and walk with God, closely with God, but then there's Enoch. There's people like Enoch who really walk with God. Like, you know those, you ever run into those people? You're just like, there's something special going on here with you and God. Um, 
like you just pray and something just happens and I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's, this is Enoch. You know, I, th- I think of uh, the story right now our, our staff is going through a book called Lead, Lead with Prayer. And in this uh, book is a story of a man who is currently uh, leading an organization that's planting thousands of cur- churches on the other side of the world. And I, what I found fascinating about this person is, are his daily rhythms. Like you would think this person is just like scattered busy. His daily rhythm is to pray and read scripture for seven hours a day. Seven hours. When I read that, I was just like, what in the world? There's no way. This dude's like helping lead this organization. How in the world is he taking time to spend seven hours a day in prayer and scripture? And, and from his own testimony, it's the power of God working. That's how God works. And, uh, and I was just encouraged to hear that. So, but his story kind of makes me think of Enoch. Like, okay, probably something like this. This guy, Enoch's probably something like this. He's just kind of walking very closely with God. Um, when I read this, when I read this passage, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, okay, Enoch recognizes one who's pleased with God. What is it about Enoch that makes him pleasing with God? It is in this phrase. It's walking in close fellowship with God. That God is actually interested in this relationship with us. And, and the relationship is unique and specific because uh, you can have a, a vague relationship with anybody, right? You could have a business type relationship. You could have a relationship where you're kind of using the person towards an end, like the person themselves is not the end, but there's different types of relationships you could have. What I want us to help understand here is that this is a faithful relationship. And so in, in the text, there's the Hebrew word halek. And I know I'm like, I could hear some of my guys giving me feedback. I like, don't do slides like this, but I just, I have to sometimes. So there's this word, halek, and it means walked, walked, and, it, and it's used in the phrase like walking with God. And so you hear that in, in church lingo. If you stick around uh, in the church community for a while, people will ask you, what is, what is your walk with God looking like? How is your walk with God going? So that's, that's where this is coming from, this walking language. What's interesting is that the, in the Septuagint copies of the Old Testament, they use the Greek word, eurysteo, and that means to be pleased, uh, to be pleasing to, or to please someone. So we have this kind of combination of ideas here that there's, for Enoch, he is this, he's walking out this life, living this life with God, and he's found also pleasing to God. Um, and so I think the best way to understand this kind of Com- combo here is to understand it's a faithful relationship with God. And it can be hard for us at times to, to picture that because, uh, because the way we primarily understand relationships is with one another. And God himself is not, uh, is without form is what the scriptures say, except for Jesus. We'll get to that. But God was, is without form. So it, it, can, it can feel like, okay, how, how is it that this relationship looks like with a God who I cannot see, I cannot touch, how do I have an actual real relationship where there's communication going back and forth? What does that look like? Um, and by nature of this relationship, the fact that he's God changes the d- dynamics of the relationship as well. Uh, meaning that he is God and we are not God, right? Uh, he serves that he's the only one in that position, the creator, sustainer, the authority over all things. This is, this is God. We have a relationship with him. And scriptures also make clear that even in the midst of him being in the position of God, that he's also father, that he's interested in having this intimate, close relationship with us. But what, what does it look like to have this faithful relationship with God? I want to go back to Hebrews 11, five, because I think the author of Hebrews is trying to help us out here. I want to say this word that's highlighted together. Okay. It was by faith. Let's say that together one more time. It was by faith. Faith, faith. Okay. I love that Brad, he didn't do that in the first sermon, by the way, or first uh, service. So yeah, he cut into my time, but it's okay. We'll cut it short a little bit. But uh, he chose, I just love Brad's example in that. What he was encouraging us to do is step forward in confidence. Uh, There is a direct connection between faith and confidence. And there is, it is, I will tell you, this is one that I personally struggle with. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but but a lot of times we think our confidence could be, no, be like we could have confidence in how much we know. The way we actually get to know God for who he is is by stepping forward in faith. Let's look at the next text, Hebrews eleven six. So just the verse following after. And it is impossible to please God without faith. 
So this kind of faith is impossible to please God. You can't do enough things to please God. It's impossible. What you need is faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. What we have in this text are three things, practical ways in which you can live out faith in a way that's, that's, re, that's encouraging our uh, faithful relationship with God. These three things are one, it involves coming to him and a desire to come to him. And I think it's interesting that we, we start first with that, even before believing sometimes. Because it's like, sometimes I don't know about you, but I have a struggle. I wake up in the morning and I could be struggling like to believe but it's in my coming in faith that, Lord, I know that if I come to you, though, you will meet with me and you will guide me. So I'm coming to you in faith. Faith involves coming to him. It co- involves coming to him in prayer and, and presenting yourself before him humbly, before him. But in part two, it is to believe that God exists. It's to believe that God exists. And, and, and what this means <laughs> um, is not just like, okay, there is a God who exists and I could be right if I think of him this way and I could be right if I think about him in this way. No, there is a reality to who God is and it is worth every effort of ours to get to know him for who he is. He does not change, the scriptures say. He is who he is. And the third point of faith and practically applying our faith is, um, is seeking him out. Seeking him out for who he is, to hope in uh, and him showing up when we seek him out. Um, that he, and that he rewards those who seek him. So this word seek uh, is from the Greek word zeteo. And it is, uh, it is a word that means to search earnestly for, to inquire, uh, to seek out. It's just like, I, I kind of know, but I'm like stepping forward in a direction to get to know more. This is the, is the picture of seeking out. So kind of like um, a very practical application of this uh, or example is John 6. Jesus does a miracle. He feeds 5,000 people with just five loaves, two fish. The crowd, when they experience this miracle, like, whoa, this guy's crazy. This is awesome. We're going to make him king. And Jesus flees, goes with his disciples to Capernaum, and the crowd chases after Jesus. When the crowd arrives in Capernaum to where Jesus is, Jesus uses this word. Zeteo, it means to seek. He says, he addresses their heart. He says, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs and therefore knew who I am, which is the whole purpose of the book of John. You're not seeking me because you know you're, you're seeking me for me. You're seeking me because I fed you and you're looking for more food. This, this is what, so they are spending, and then he says, don't spend your energy seeking or working you know, for food, but seek the food that lasts for eternal life. And then he gives them the work. They ask him, what is this work that you give us to do? And it is to believe in Jesus. And so there is there is a reality it, that this faith is both like, we could say the word and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, I get it. It's simple, but it's super hard. It takes all our energy to seek him out for who he is. Like, I don't know about you, but I've had moments where I'm praying and I'm just like, man, I'm just struggling. I don't know what it is, Lord. And I invite him into the moment. And then eventually God does meet with me. That reward that, that scripture is talking about here, that he rewards those who seek him. It's not like I seek God because I'm, I'm heading this direction in life and I'm really looking for favor for what I have planned here. No, the reward is himself. He rewards you with himself. When you seek him out for who he is, he reveals himself to you. And God reveals what he wants you to know is that he is with you. You know, Brad, Brad and I and a few others, we were at the rehab center this Wednesday. And after the Bible study, I was talking to a resident there. He is, was a deacon at a local church and still is, uh, but he, he's there stuck at the rehab center. He got into a car wreck, got paralyzed on half of his body. Uh, pretty tragic situation. But since I got to know a little bit more about who he was, I, just, I, I stopped and asked him, I was like, Anthony, could you just tell me, like, in all of what you're experiencing these last few years, being here at the rehab center, the car wreck, what is, like, one or two things that you would say, like, you've learned about who God is? And this is what he said. He said that God is always with me. This is a guy who experienced a pretty tragic situation, changed his whole life. He said that God is always with me. People 
will come and go. And people, st- there's some people who stay faithful and are friends and there for me, but God is always with me. He's assured me of that. And I just love hearing that because in the name of Jesus, that's, that's what God's trying to communicate to us, that he wants to be with us. He is, Jesus is God with us. And this is exactly what pleases God is those who are pursuing God for himself to get to know him and can trust in his faithfulness in their, in their lives. So I wanna talk uh, this book. So we're, we're reading verses five and six here. The entire chapter of 11, uh, chapter 11 in Hebrews is about faith. And the author of Hebrews starts out the chapter by defining faith. So let's look to that, that, uh, that verse here. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So, okay, we're thinking about a faithful relationship. This faithful relationship involves faith. What is faith? Faith shows the reality of what, what we hope for, and it's the evidence of the things we cannot see. There is an intimate relationship between our faith and what we hope for. You see here, faith is the reality and the evidence of what we hope for, what we cannot see. Here's like how that practically works out. If I'm hoping for something that I cannot see, especially something in the future, right, that's how hope is, is used. I cannot see it, but it's in my, my confidence in the hope that is to come that I'm practically applying faith and making faith steps towards the direction of that hope. You understand what I'm saying? So, I mean, on a practical level, if I hope to see, I'm running a business and I hope to see it reach a certain uh, size or whatever it is, I have, and I have good reason to believe it will reach there. I have this hope, like this is gonna happen and I'm going to make the steps necessary to head and see that come to fruition, right? That's, that's a lower example, but here's, here's even a better example. If, I, if my hope is in God, if my hope is in God for who he says he is and who he's revealed himself to be in my life and in the person of Jesus, what am I gonna do if my hope is in him and know that he's gonna be with me? I can think of one practical application, pray. I'm gonna pray. Prayer is such a powerful act of faith. And I know even me saying that, that it's, it's hard, it can be very hard to practice, not only because it can be foreign to you, but because maybe you've had past experience with prayer and you felt let, let down. There's a lot of emotions that come up with, with prayer. But prayer is essential, essential for getting to know God in a very personal, personal way for all of who we hope him to be. It's seeking him out in prayer, prayer in scripture and in his community. There's a lot of ways, things he uses in our lives to help us actually know relationally the God that we read about and who we see in Jesus. The author of Hebrews doesn't just leave with this definition. Um, He also uh, provides examples of faith. And I think these are are super helpful. Um, He gives quite a few examples of how faith is lived out in people's lives, specifically looking at the Old Testament. We just read one about Enoch. There's one in particular that stands out to me and it is, uh, he starts in Hebrews 11, eight and it's the story of Abraham. So I wanna read that together. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. I'll stop right there for just a minute. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed. When he was told by God to leave his home country, he did not know where he was going. Anybody else like, like me in that, I don't like to start going somewhere without knowing where I'm going. God's invitation in faith is not first to know, it's first to go. And not, not, I'm not talking about missionally here. I am, I'm talking about stepping forward in faith. It's, it's choosing to believe that what he said, who he is, is true. And I start making life decisions, small decisions, big decisions in a direction towards that aim. You guys understand what I'm saying? And this is why faith in Jesus say, is, is so Im- important. We come to know God for who he is when we place our faith in Jesus. When we look to him and believe God is revealed in Jesus, and that we begin to follow Jesus. When we begin to follow Jesus, we start to experience God a little bit more powerfully for who he is. 
we actually, and, and this is really hard, like I said, for my journey, like I, t- I want to know, I want to study the things, I want to know for sure before I start making steps. That's not how it works. We come to know when we step forward in faith. So we continue on, 11.8 or 11.9. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in the tents. And so did Isaac, Jacob, who inherited the same promise. So Abraham has made that initial decision. He's heading out. He doesn't know where he's going. He's just heading in the direction that he knows God's called him to. And there's a land. He doesn't know where the land is. But when he arrives, God says, this is the land. And then he chooses to live there by faith. And I know Brad shared with us just the reality of what it meant for him to live on the outskirts of the city in tents. So inside the city, inside the city walls was protection, provision. Abraham is living in faith that this land is going to be given to him, but he's living in a tent. And he would have to rely on God to provide and provide protection for him. So he's living this out. He is trusting God. He is living it out in faith. Verse nine or verse 10. And Abraham, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Here's that intimate relationship between faith and hope again. At first, God, Abraham was just invited to hope in God, God's faithfulness. I'm just going to believe in God. I know he's good. This is what he's asked me to do. Trust in Jesus, trust in him. I'm going to start obeying him. And as he's obeying, God reveals more of who he is and more about his bigger plan for the world and God's kingdom coming to earth. And he starts to put his hope in God and God's work and what he's doing. The author, uh, or uh, um, I keep saying the author because we don't know the author of Hebrews, but I know the authors are, we know the authors for some people. So like, sorry, my head. Uh, Romans, uh, or sorry, Colossians 1. Uh, Paul talks about this, this relationship between faith and hope in that when he's talking to the church of Colossae, he says, guys, I just want to, I just want to say job well done. Like you guys are doing really well. Your faith in Jesus is just pure. It's so good. And your love for one another, it's just sincere and it's, it's good. But then he says, but your love and faith is fueled by your hope in the resurrection. For a lot of us, I think we, I think we spend a little too much time putting our hope in things of this life and we don't spend enough time focusing our attention on what is to come. The reality of what is to come, the reality of what God is doing right now, what he started doing when he first gave the prophecy about the man stomping, which would be Jesus on the head of the serpent, then coming in human form 2000 years ago to be with us, among us, and then to deal with our sin and be resurrected. He's, he has started a work. He is continuing a work by his spirit as people come to faith in Jesus and he will finish the work when he returns. He will restore all things. This is our hope. It is important and imperative for us for the life of our faith, for, the, for, the, uh, for our, our faith is fueled in this hope. We need to set our mind ahead to what is, what is coming. So in, in, in Abraham's, Abraham's example, we get a picture of this, of this faith. And I want to share with you guys, I've shared this once before, but I want to share with you a story that was similar for me in my experience. Uh, in a moment where I had to make a decision for, towards faith. When I, uh, when I finished college, I came back to Vegas. It was this really cool moment coming back to Vegas where I felt God leading. And um, I was excited to be a part of what God was doing here, uh, here in Henderson in Vegas. But I had made this plan. I was like, okay, God, I'm all for it. I'm going to serve your kingdom in Vegas. Uh, but here's my plan. And I'm telling God what my plan is. This is good. So I, uh, I said, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm going to come work with my parents in real estate and I'm going to build, I'm going to build a business in their brokerage and I'm going to use the funds of that to like fund me so I can, you know, do, do the ministry work. It only took a few months in to, to feel like, man, I don't know if this is what, if this is the plan God has for me in being here. And, uh, it was on, at a missions conference. I go to this missions conference with some buddies and, uh, it was at this missions conference that I felt, I heard the word, stop and listen. That's what I felt like I received from the Lord. Just stop and listen. And I knew exactly what that meant. It's like, okay, I need to stop. I need to stop building this 
this uh, plan out. I need to stop pursuing this plan. I need to listen to what the Lord has. So when I came home, it took me a couple weeks uh, to honestly make the decision. And when I made the decision, I was filled with uh, honestly a lot of anxiety at first. But then I also just felt this like, ah, oh, but this is, this is good. Like I'm, like, I'm also excited for, to see what God's going to do. And that week I spent time in prayer and in scripture and in my community. I had pastors, friends. I was talking with like, this is where I feel like God's, where God's leading me. And in one of my moments of prayer with the Lord, I got to this passage in Hebrews eleven eight, And when I heard those words, that Abraham obeyed God, even though he did not know where he was going. It was like water for my soul. And I just felt at peace. It's like, God, that's exactly it. Father, I don't know. I don't know where this goes, but I'm going to just trust you. And I know in trusting you that you're going to make things work. And I'll be honest, guys, I'm, I'm seven years in and I'm, I'm, I'm just living the same thing. I don't have a new plan. I'm not trying to be a someone or a some, do a something. I'm just following what he has next. He gives me the next step. I be there and I'm there. And, and it has been a good journey. Uh, and, for, and I think God will reveal more as I continue on. Uh, but what God has made very clear in taking even just that initial step of faith and as I've continued on, He's made known to me how faithful he truly is. There's been moments where he's shown up. And so I, I sure, I knew God, and I have had experience before that, you know, about who God is. But I came, I came to know God personally, his character, his good nature more, when I chose to step forward in faith. God invites us in moments like that. That's a, that's a bigger decision moment. And he invites us in moments, there may be something in your life right now that God is inviting you to step into. But he also invites us just on a daily, on a daily basis. With author, what the author of Hebrews said in 11.6, just coming to him. There's a daily coming to him, believing in him for who he is and seeking him out. That is the work. That is the work to seek him out. All of even my steps of faith, right? The big ones, the small ones, all are towards that aim of knowing God for who he truly is. And he has all of us on that same journey. If we choose to believe in him, to trust him. When I was wrestling through this text, I just, I felt like uh, over the last few weeks, I, I just, when I first read this, the, the word that came to my mind was just trust. That God, ultimately, all he wants is for me to trust him. All God wants, in, like, I don't have to fight for this approval for Enoch, right? He was found as one who was pleasing to God because he had a faithful relationship with God. That's it. All God wants is an intimate, close relationship with him. He wants us to live in close fellowship with himself. And all, all that means, practically for us, is that we put faith in his faithfulness. My faith is not in my faithfulness. Now I'm trusting in his faithfulness. When I make steps of obedience, it's not because, whoa, good, good me, you know, pat on the back. No, no, no. I'm just making steps and I'm making decisions in life because I'm counting on his faithfulness. As I obey him, it's because of, I'm trusting in his faithfulness. And praise the Lord that even when I'm faithless, he remains faithful. Can I hear an amen on that? Yeah. Anybody else experience that in life? Yeah. He remains faithful, but don't, don't wait. Don't wait long to start seeking him, to turn to him. This is a daily journey. It's a lifelong journey. And man, it is worth it. It is worth it now and it's worth it in the end. God is doing a work in you. If you'll let him, if you'll seek him out, keep your eyes fixed on him. He's doing a work in you that will be revealed in the resurrection, it's going to be glorious. And you get to participate in the great work that he's doing, not just in you, but in the whole world, in the big story.